At this point, the system is collapsing, and in my opinion, there is no bailout anymore either. You have to ask yourself, who is behind this World Health Organization? We are witnessing an internationally orchestrated fascistic finance coup. I think that the hysteria surrounding the coronavirus serves the purpose of dispossession. They will need to have the people under control. The best thing is if people are in their houses. How convenient to maybe shut down parts of the Internet. And police are patrolling the street. I think it's absolutely possible that we will see a total lockdown come into place soon. This is a historic opportunity to make it clear to everyone what is actually going on behind the scenes. I believe, for example, that the total lockdown coming our way is a means to an end to gain time a few days before certain decisions will have to be made. Dear viewers of Eingeschenk TV, we have traveled spontaneously to Berlin via a very empty highway and here we are on March 20th, 2020 at 12 noon. This is the time when we are filming this video. The events are coming thick and fast and already tomorrow, or maybe next week, the world may look very different. I welcome Ernst Wolf. Dear Ernst, you are the author of The Financial Tsu Tsunami is Coming. So where are we at? Is this the beginning or are we right in the middle of it? We are right in the middle of it. What we are witnessing is the last and final wave of this tsunami. In fact, we have already witnessed two bigger waves. The first one was in 1998 when the financial system was already close to total collapse. The second time was in 2007-2008 when it was rescued by the central banks through enormous financial injections and continuous interest rate reductions. And now we probably have the final wave because what we are seeing with the crashes at the stock and bond markets means that the derivatives bombs must have exploded in the background. The system is done. We are witnessing the moment of complete and utter collapse of the financial system that has existed for the last 70 years. We both know that in theory, the intrinsically valueless unbacked fiat money system with its compound interest and all that it has limited. Correct. In the past, the central banks have already tried to resuscitate this doomed system in markets through cuts in interest rates and saturating the markets with money. Could this work once more? I suppose it won't work again, as we had a major change last December. No, more and more money was pumped into the system, interest rates were reduced further, and then they tried to stabilize the system to bring it back to its normal modus operandi, but last December it went wrong. Since last December we are seeing the interest rates cut yet again, drastically so. We have had two interest rate reductions in the USA, really drastic ones indeed. One was a half percent, and I think the last one was one and a half or one and a quarter percent. Either way, it was a slide down to zero, and this happened on a Sunday night. Correct. The regular meeting should have taken place the following Wednesday. This, of course, was a signal to the markets that the house is on fire. We can't wait until Wednesday. Correct. It shows that the central banks are running out of options to try and save the system. They only have two options. They can pump more money into the system and they can reduce the interest rates until they are in minus. But these last two interest rate reductions already didn't work. The investors, the people, sold large amounts of their shares. Went into the bonds and they bought huge amounts of gold and silver. The system is collapsing at this point and in my opinion there is no bailout anymore either. And for this reason, one has to go looking for someone to blame for the collapse, and I think they have found the culprit in the form of a virus. But that one doesn't have an address, does it? Exactly. And you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an expert in medicine, but I know how to read and write. And I know a lot of things we are being told do not, just do not add up. I was also a bit afraid and got hoodwinked in the beginning by that virus when the first news came from China. And the first horror stories emerged from Italy, but then one has to step back and start examining where these news stories are actually coming from. The news about the virus cases came from the World Health Organization and then you have to ask, who is behind the World Health Organization?
The WHO was founded in 1948 by multiple countries and was also mostly financed by these countries for the first few decades. But that changed with deregulation, a very important phenomenon within the financial sector as regulation arrived together with a wave of privatization. And this wave of privatization also caught up with the WHO. Since the 1970s, state funding has continuously reduced and private funding has increased. Private foundations and pharmaceutical companies took over, and today these private foundations and big pharma are funding the WHO up to 85% and more. Is the WHO a lobbying group for big pharma? I would say yes, because if you look at who's got the biggest influence, then it is not the individual countries, but the private foundations and pharmaceutical companies. And private foundations are nothing else than organizations where rich people hide their money from the tax authorities. Okay. It's not really a trustworthy setup, and the biggest private foundation at the moment, interestingly, is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation which also touts itself as a humanitarian foundation, but one should really take a look at the shares they own. They own huge shares in Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, companies that really aren't beneficial to public health. This is really interesting. They have a huge influence on this organization, who, as does Big Pharma. And then you have to look at what happened during the past during other pandemics. I've had a look at the bird flu in 2005 and there were similar reactions from the WHO like today. There was, for example, a WHO influenza director who proclaimed that they were expecting 7 million dead victims. There was an incredible hysteria back then too with the result that governments bought huge supplies of medication from the pharmaceutical companies. But the final statistics show that in the end, the bird flu caused worldwide about 150 deaths and not a single death in Germany. But they, Big Pharma, made their money. The big pharmaceutical companies made their money and there's another really interesting aspect to this. In 2007, this said influenza director left to work for one of the biggest pharmaceuticals in the world, Novartis. There are various interests at work in the background. I think it's important to recognize that. Because then you can judge the situation differently, even as a medical layman, and then you don't need to fall for the current hysteria so much. So, there is clear evidence that people make money of this fear-mongering. At the same time, we have this bubble of derivatives which explodes. Markets crash, everything crashes, the first companies close down, and the states respond, the countries respond, with the usual tactics. Pumping ever more money into the system, reducing interest rates, short-term workers, and so on. The following corona panic, this clashes directly with a scenario where the, the countries worldwide are shutting down their economies in an orchestrated effort. This massively complicates the situation. I always say to my clients that the money bubble always gets inflated again when the offer of products and services is already getting smaller. Due to the shutdown that is being enforced now, isn't that basically the perfect recipe for a hyperinflation? Yes, absolutely. Long term, this would be the beginning of a hyperinflation. We have already seen this in Hong Kong, the first country to introduce helicopter, helicopter money, meaning that every citizen receives a specific sum from the central bank or the government straight in to their accounts, the USA too. The US also announced helicopter money last week, as did other governments. For me, the helicopter money is a last desperate attempt to save a system that is beyond saving. Because helicopter money can't be paid out only once, it needs to be distributed regularly. Especially if you're shutting down the economy, you have to give money to people. And this money needs to be spent on consuming, which of course means that prices will go up and a hyperinflation is triggered. But I don't think it will last that long. 
but sarcastically speaking, I could say that the helicopter money is quite useful at the moment given that the oil price has just tumbled. And here we have the second important arena. We are not just dealing with the complete destruction of the global financial system, but we are also on the threshold of a reshuffling of the global strategic order. There was an event in March that weirdly didn't get too much publicity, and that was the OPEC conference in Vienna. All the oil exporting countries, together with OPEC Plus members like Russia and a few others, met there. So it was basically the biggest assembly of oil producing countries in the world. Saudi Arabia, the most important, or one of the most important allies of the U.S. in the Middle East, openly defied the USA here, but the whole thing was covered up. Supposedly, Saudi Arabia and Russia couldn't agree when it came to deciding on reducing the oil production. To keep the oil price high, yes, because at the moment there's too little demand for oil as not enough is being produced, hence they wanted to reduce the oil supply rate to keep the price relatively stable. They didn't agree, and in the end, there was supposedly a big quarrel between Saudi and Russia. But when you look closer, you realize that the big loser in this is really the U.S. The fracking. The U.S. has tried and in fact succeeded to become independent energy-wise. They are self-sufficient at this stage. Though for years the country was a major oil importer, hundreds of billions of U.S. dollars have been pumped into this fracking industry. Lots of speculative money, but this industry needs a relatively high price for oil, roughly U.S. 60 to 70 dollars a barrel. But with the oil price at U.S. 20 or 26, they are writing huge financial deficits. Companies are now inevitably collapsing. Many investors are losing their money and add to the mix that we have the biggest credit bubble in the world ever. All of the loans that need repaying can't be repaid anymore at this point, meaning that the number of bad loans is growing exponentially. The financial system is being brought to its knees from several angles and it won't be able to survive this for long. And the next problem is the derivative bubble. The price drop of oil to under US 30 alone would have imploded that bubble. Oil is the most traded commodity in the world and all trade actions are secured via derivatives. Derivatives are not only bets, but they're also bets which are used to hedge transactions. But these hedges only work if the prices are reasonably kept. One of the phenomena we have witnessed in the last few years is that the central banks have always prevented the stock and bond markets from crashing and spinning out of control. And the most important reason to keep this system in balance is the huge amount of derivatives in the background. And the insane thing is that no one knows just how many derivatives even exist in the world. The Bank of International Settlements, BIS, in Basel regularly releases estimates, and according to their latest estimate, we are looking at around 700 trillion U.S. dollars in derivatives. No one knows just how much is actually being traded. Exactly, you have these over-the-counter transactions which do not have to go onto the company's books resulting in a huge black market. Insiders estimate this to be about 1.25 trillion dollars. Actually, I think that's quad, really. And even if that number was wrong, even though the derivative bubble definitely blew up a few days ago and the global finance system is broken. You can compare this with shooting a rabbit. Once the rabbit is hit, it will still run about 30 to 40 yards before collapsing. So even if it's already dead, it just collapses at the very end. Hearing these numbers, the 750 billion euro that the ECB wants to pump into the financial system by buying all sorts of assets, high yield bonds, potentially shares, they really pale in comparison. It's like emptying a small watering can into a raging inferno. It's too little too late from a higher point of view, but it is, of course, a service to the major investors. As we know, the money isn't distributed to the general population. It goes directly to them. Right now, the U.S. government is busy distributing money to Boeing, a company that has raked in profits of multiple billions in the last few decades. And now, just before the house is about to collapse, they get financial aid on top. 
We are witnessing a last-minute plunder of the burning house. Everything is up for grabs, and the major investors are getting the last good bits. But even without the derivatives bubble, which is on a completely different level, the shutdown of the economy would now push small to medium-sized businesses, which simply can't afford not having profits for four to eight weeks, into insolvency. And thus we have missing loan repayments leading to increased problems in the banking sector, which has been having problems to begin with. So what does that all mean then? It's a deliberate induction of a crash. This crash is deliberately brought about. So principally speaking, our financial system isn't just being shot down, it's also being poisoned and stabbed at the same time. Exactly. And in the end, it's being plundered. But there are some interesting phenomena for last week. For example, on Tuesday, Volkswagen announced it would be closing many factories due to the coronavirus spread. On Tuesday. That's a completely crazy thing, as normally VW would have made such an announcement on a Friday evening after the stock markets are closed. Because they know their shares are going to go into freefall. But something else comes into play here, the opportunity to make a lot of money from falling share prices through short selling. Any insiders who ever knew in advance that VW would be making this announcement on Tuesday morning could bet on the falling share prices and cash in a lot of money that way. That works as long as the issuers have something to issue and that once again hits the distributing banks the hardest. Yes, absolutely. We are in the final phase of this financial system and we are witnessing a looting orgy by the major investors. For the little man in the street, this is of course horrific. But there is another thing I'd like to mention, the fact that Amazon just hired 100,000 new workers last week. Amazon is one of the biggest winners here, one of the biggest corporations in the world, which hasn't paid any tax anywhere for the last two years. On the contrary, it has received tax incentives. This corporation's profits skyrocket while small businesses are going bankrupt. But we have to also ask ourselves, what's going to happen from here on forth? Yes, exactly. This situation that we are in now cannot continue like this. And so, this is now my question. What do you think? We are in the realm of expectations and predictions at the moment, which is why this video is so incredibly important and potentially... Dear, dear viewers, below you see a button. Please subscribe. Please share, share, share. And now we move on. What does the future hold? It's incredibly hard to predict what will happen, and I don't have a crystal ball, but some things definitely can be forecast. The system is beyond saving, which means, somehow, they will need to act. There are several options on the table now. The option of a currency reform. You see, they have closed the borders everywhere. There is the option of reintroducing the DMARC. There is also the possibility that Germany will withdraw all its debts from the EU. Or it has been put down a lot of guarantees for other countries in the EU that of course puts a strain on the German budget. So there is this possibility that one day they will say, we won't pay these debts back to the EU. So another option is the reintroduction of the Deutschmark, but I'm afraid that won't be enough. What I suspect is that they will implement a plan from the International Monetary Fund. They already proposed back in 2013 to expropriate all citizens to a certain percentage, bail-ins. So they could potentially shave off 25 or 50 percent of the cash accounts of all citizens. Well, normally a currency reform is always associated with dispossession. During a currency reform, one normally expropriates via the new exchange rate of the currency, but I think in this case this alone will not be enough. So you mean equalization of burdens 2.0? Yes, exactly. Which income and asset groups are in danger here? What do you think? I think all income groups are in danger here. We have only seen in the past how this works. One should only have a look at how this was done in Greece and Cyprus. Back when the people of Cyprus were expropriated, the International Monetary Fund suggested at first to take 25% of every citizen's wealth. But then the politicians came and said, you know what, we can't push this through, there will be riots in the street. So they made 20,000 euro or 50,000 euro the exemption, and in the end, they expropriated people with a wealth of 100,000 euro and more. They took everything above that. 
But I don't think that this will be the case this time. I think that the hysteria surrounding the coronavirus serves the purpose of dispossession. They will need to have the people under control. The best thing is if people are in their houses, how convenient would it be to shut down parts of the Internet? Police are patrolling the streets. I think it's absolutely possible that we will see a total lockdown come into place soon as well, and that they will just announce, by the way, you have just become poorer by X percentage, oh, and we are introducing a new currency. This is their way of preparing for protests, because the truth is that people won't just accept this, they will rise up. A currency reform has to be prepared meticulously, otherwise there is chaos, and truly I don't want to be out in the streets then either, it'll be a civil war. If you separate all this for a moment from the coronavirus and just look at the lockdown, shops closed, people being repatriated from other countries, no one is allowed in or out. I feel like I'm in the wrong film. But if I add up all these points, it does look dangerously like that. The question that remains is, when? Yes, this is the big question, a decisive question. We are witnessing an internationally orchestrated fascistic finance coup. It is really interesting. All countries seem to be towing the line. Yesterday I heard that the Swiss National Bank, for example, is working on new cryptic francs. Crypto francs. Predictions are always tricky, particularly in this case, but assuming there will be a new currency, how do you think it will be designed? It's impossible to say at this point. A gold backed currency may come. Gold may play a big role here. The reintroduction of the gold standard, but there aren't any agreements. At the moment, the central banks and the hedge funds in the background are the biggest players in this scenario. And I'm pretty sure they are having one emergency meeting after the other at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. In the last few years, we have seen the central banks coordinate their politics with each other. And speaking of the Swiss central bank, they, owe huge, they own huge shares of Apple, Netflix, Google, etc., so they have been certainly helping each other to keep the market somehow stable. But this scenario is over, and now we will see which central banks are the strongest and which ones are the weakest. I can't predict how this is going to develop. I can only imagine that those in the background who really hold the reins in this they are really up against it to get this back under control. I believe, for example, that the total lockdown coming our way is a means to, end to, to an end to gain time a few days before certain decisions will have to be made. There are enough helpers in the area here that were supposed to do the Defender 2020, but does it matter at all if the central bank is strong or weak? Aren't we so globalized and so connected that this big domino needs to be tapped on one side only and then everyone and everything falls? Yes, absolutely. This domino effect is in action right now. That is why everything is collapsing. I'm asking because of Norway and its oil resources, its sovereign wealth funds. Norway has an extremely solid national economy and yet the Norwegian krone has dramatically lost in value in the last few days. Yes, because everyone is so closely connected. The Deutsche Bank is so intrinsically tied to J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, etc. No one can decide or do anything anywhere without it affecting everybody else. But the closing of the borders everywhere, this is a huge signal for me, pushing the nationalism. One always has to remember that there is one international power in the world, and that is the financial industry. They don't care about borders. They have never paid attention to them, but have taken advantage whenever they could, wherever they could. So whenever one country wasn't dancing to their fiddle, they would simply move on to the next, and thus always managed. The fact is that they are closing the borders now everywhere 
is a sign to me that the financial elites are banking on separating people via the national borders, and for me, that is an important aspect. It is indeed a complete U-turn, but thank you very much, first of all. But our purpose isn't to spread fear, but to say, hey guys, the house is on fire, and figure out what can be done. Have you withdrawn your money from the bank already? Well, I don't trust the banks anyway, but that just comes with the job territory. It's extremely important for the individual person to understand the bigger picture, as it is much easier to manage a situation if you know which powers are at work here. And a lot of people are feeling very unsettled because of the medical hysteria out there. And I want to tell them to go and have a look at the who and who they really are. Have a look at the videos of certain professionals and doctors who are trying to give a balanced view and don't participate in the panic out there. Always remember that this hysteria, this panic, is artificially created and that someone benefits. Other than that, I can only tell people that it has always been important in life to have supplies at home so that you are not dependent on others in an emergency situation, especially as I believe that a total lockdown will come our way. Everyone should make sure they are taking care of themselves, but not through panic buying and hoarding. Simply through sensible supplies for one to two weeks that is absolutely possible still at this point. It will become more difficult in the coming weeks because the supplies might not reach the shops quickly enough, and they won't be in the usual quantities if the economy is being shut down the way it is now. The other thing is to get to the banks and get some cash out. Cash is really important as I expect that there will be a bank holiday at some point and so everyone will be dependent on cash points. Then you have to look back in history again to Greece, to Cyprus and what happened there for weeks. Huge queues of people and in the end each person only got 20 euros if anything was left at all. There will be bottlenecks for sure, so I'd recommend to all viewers to be prepared and to get some more cash out for the next days. If enough time is left to convert our cash into more appropriate assets, what assets would you recommend? First of all, I think non-material values are a lot more important. But sure, you can go ahead now and buy your children and grandchildren what you wanted to always buy them. Or book a language course somewhere that someday you can actually go to enjoy. Stuff like that may feel worthwhile for some. Of course, there is a concern that the cash money you do have will be worth less a little bit further down the track. People always recommend to buy gold and silver, but you can't buy bread with gold coins. And for the most part, the gold reserves have been snatched up anyway. If you can get your hands on a few silver coins, that might be worth to consider because you can pay for bread with silver coins at the bakery during times of emergency and crisis. But of course, they are difficult to get too. The silver shops have closed also. Yes, exactly. And since I come from that industry myself, I'm aware that the supply chains are not working. Last Thursday, it was already announced that the Canadian and the U.S. Mint are sold out completely. There are no more flights. I would have loved to book a journey around the world last minute, but that isn't even possible anymore. What I find also important to flag for viewers with long-term or severe illnesses is their medication supply. I'm not suggesting to buy loads of medication and hoard it at home so that others are left empty-handed, but to have a chat with their pharmacist about how long supplies will last and to be prepared for a worst-case scenario. You mention a really interesting thing here as we are talking about the coronavirus and how this is becoming the scapegoat for these uncertain times, the culprit of the deaths reported to the media. We are constantly being told, what do you think is going to happen now that these supply chains are broken, medication supplies are short, businesses are going bankrupt, potential dispossession? Isn't there a huge potential for more people to die from a statistical point of view because of their mental health? They throw themselves out the window or they can't get their medication, not dying from COVID-19. It's completely irresponsible, but it's not like we haven't seen this. There are constantly children dying in Iran from lack of medication due to sanctions. 
But just how little that matters, how little human lives matter, that is seen time and time again. All you need to do is watch a YouTube video with the former foreign minister of the U.S., Madeleine Albright. In that interview, she is being asked about the sanctions on Iran, how they have cost the lives of 30,000 children. And whether she thinks it was still worth it? And she replies, yes, she absolutely thinks it was worth it, regardless. These are the types of people we are dealing with. Those are the people defining and regulating our lives. Everyone should know that. And again, I don't want to spread panic, but I want to enable people to look at the bigger picture. What is left to do for the national governments, or are they part of the game? They are part of the game. Or are they the ones being chased? No, I think to a large part they are also clueless, especially when it comes to finance. It's mind-boggling how clueless many are. But all of them are participating in this game now. They are not interested in the people's health, that's pretty obvious. Let's assume for a moment that the coronavirus is as dangerous as the government say it is. Then our government would have to be called absolutely negligent, as so much was known at the beginning of January and absolutely nothing was done. But back then the government simply belittled the whole thing and Mr. Spahn stepped in front of the cameras and assured us that everything is under control, saying it's not so bad. And now the same guy steps in front of the cameras again and says the exact opposite. Schools have to be closed, shops have to be shut down, people and companies basically have to be tossed under the bus, so to speak. I think it's pretty obvious that this guy has zero moral principles and neither does the bunch of minions around him. I can't help but think of a word game here. You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. So theoretically speaking, they would have had to cancel virtually. Absolutely, if this really had been so dangerous, Carnival would have been canceled. And that was the first time that I thought, hang on a minute, this doesn't add up. In the beginning, I was actually quite worried myself, especially seeing the videos from China showing the many body bags. And I thought, holy moly, what's coming our way here? But then there are only two options. Either the virus wasn't quite as dangerous as announced, or it was really that dangerous and they were being completely negligent. But since I know what is happening in the financial sector at this point, the final wave of the tsunami, suddenly things are starting to make sense. Oh, oh, oh. These really are difficult times, I have to be honest to the viewers, really difficult times, and also dangerous times, and it's not because I want to spread panic, but we are at a dangerous threshold on the cusp of an internationally orchestrated fascistic financial coup. Okay, but everyone seems to be involved here. The WHO, the BIS, the EU, the Chinese and the Americans. And everyone is involved and going nuts. Everyone is acting in concert. Do you think a global currency could be rolled out? I can't rule out anything. But then we're totally trapped. Anything is possible at this point. So how do we get rid of the very people who are constantly taking us for a ride? I think the most important thing really is to inform people. They have to understand where all this is coming from. And the moment a lot of people are locking themselves up in their flats and houses and they're terrified of the virus. I've been running around for 10 years trying to explain to people that the biggest threat to their health is the current financial system we live with. The financial elite, the people plundering the system now as it's on its last legs, those people do not care about human lives or well-being. They are trying to grab everything they can get their hands on and they are a huge threat to humanity. So the most important thing is that people understand what is going on behind the scenes and this is a huge chance when people are asking themselves what the heck is actually going on here. <coughs> but our politicians are now playing the heroes of the 11th hour so to speak, crisis managers par excellence. But they aren't. Yesterday I watched the video of Angela Merkel, our Chancellor, speaking of the greatest historical challenge, using the superlative, and yet she spoke with such a sleepy voice. There was no alignment of content in her rhetoric. I nearly fell asleep. Do you think that voters recognize that those in charge, at least those in charge in the last years, that they have been playing a charade and that maybe in the future one shouldn't trust them anymore quite so easily? 
möglicherweise in Zukunft nicht mehr vertrauen kann? Of course, there is still some level of trust by the people into the system. And Angela Merkel's speech to the nation was certainly an attempt to pacify the country and simultaneously plant the seeds of the coming restrictions without, of course, saying exactly what is going to happen. I'm pretty sure that a total lockdown and other restrictions will come, but many people are in such a panic at the moment that they can't think clearly, and that is exactly where the powers that be want them to be. But those are the people we should be having a conversation with and talk about the bigger mechanisms behind this and encourage everyone to take a stand. They will have plenty of time for that during the lockdown as long as the video gets shared enough. I hope so. Before a total lockdown, for as long as there is time, they can prepare. I have supplies for three weeks, a bit of precious metal. My accounts are in order so that the ongoing payments are covered, and that's it. There isn't much else I can do. I don't want to join the panic bus, or did I forget anything important? I think it's really important to connect with people and to reach out to others, especially in times of crisis. Just as it is important to get some cash out and have enough food supplies. This is a historic opportunity to make it clear to everyone what is actually happening behind the scenes. A historic opportunity has presented through this situation and we need to make the best use of it. You grew up in China. Born in China, but I grew up in Korea. But you know the Chinese word for risk. No, sorry, crisis. The two has two meanings in Chinese, danger and opportunity. Big change is coming our way, and very good things may come out of this too, but that's not a given, not guaranteed. Now it's important for people to be sensible and add one and one together, and similar to the safety announcements on an airplane, where they encourage you to put on your oxygen mask first before helping others. But then to really help others, especially when it comes to making choices such as who should represent us on national government level in this country. How can we ensure that we get a financial and economic system that truly works for the majority? And not for a small clique behind closed doors that is making plans to fill their own pockets at the expense of others. I can only sign off on that. I can't ask you more at this moment and I don't want to stretch this out too long. But have we forgotten anything? Do you have any closing thoughts? I don't think so, other than really encouraging the people out there to inform others and help others who may be really helpless at this point. Really try and help them. This is the most important thing. Really try and act socially. Think about the future of your children and grandchildren. It is crucial for them that this system is replaced by a democratic monetary system. Thanks so much. Can I shake your hand despite the coronavirus and despite the financial crisis? We'd love to catch up with you again in a few weeks' time when we have an idea of how things are playing out. I wish you all the very best and please share this video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you, Ernst Wolf. Thanks very much.